If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. So, riding along here in the 1956 DeSoto Fireflight Sportsman Coupe with my colleague and friend Ben Chester, taking a forward look and setting the pace. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about, Ben? Well, that's great wordplay, Donald, because I know we're in uh, the 56 DeSoto, not the 55. Mm -hmm. um, just the first few minutes of this, I feel like an elegant sportsman. I feel like we could just drive forever in this thing. And, uh, of course, my subtle reference to pace is the fact that the 56 DeSoto was the uh, pace car for the 56 Indy 500. Yep. Yep, and it did it very well from what I understand. I wasn't there to witness it, but from what I've read, I think it did a great job putting the brand uh, you know, into a major position to sell well and perform well. And uh, it's interesting too, thinking about the traditional ladder of brands, of course pioneered by General Motors, but copied certainly by Ford and Chrysler, yep. to provide a different driving experience at each price range in the market, right. the lower price range, the mid price range, and the upper price range, uh, Chrysler had four product lines across those uh, ranges, actually five when you count the fact that the Imperial was a separate division for a little while. Mm -hmm. So you had Plymouth, Dodge, DeSoto, and Chrysler. Mm -hmm. And DeSoto did its job so well, uh, you know, as a mid priced car, with all this comfort, with all these features, like I said, you could just drive forever in this thing, and you're never thinking that it's a mid-priced car, especially with all this big trip. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just great. It is very much quintessential 1950s, and an interesting observation as well, which is that um, a lot of people have reflected on the market changing and moving forward, mm -hmm. and, and younger people not having an interest in cars of the 50s. Mm. And it's quite interesting to see that while when cars of the 50s were sort of the big thing in the collector car market yeah. about 25 years ago, yeah. the cars that people were really after were Chevys, the Tri-5 Chevys, 55, 56, 57. And nobody really thought about the Chrysler product. Mm -hmm. And yet today, while those Chevys and some of the other cars of the 1950s are languishing, interest in cars like this has never been higher. The, this whole period uh, was such a, uh, a forward-thinking time uh, with the design, with the engineering, but in terms of collecting today, if I were to have one car, I don't think it would be a 56 DeSoto, but in a fleet of three or four, to get an experience like this, you know, driving to work or on a Sunday, you know, with the family, it's, it's the perfect car for that, and it's something that, you know, fits well in any garage as long as the garage is big enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, um, the range of cars and the scope of cars in terms of physical size is certainly very different back in the 50s than it is today. Um, now, this is, by any uh, measure, a full-sized car. Yeah. Um, and it's also an interesting point to note that you mentioned a Sunday cruise with the family. Yeah. But practically all, with the exception of some of the smaller Plymouths, of the Chrysler Corporation offerings in the 1950s were really performance oriented. Right. This is a 255 horsepower V8 engine, yeah. which is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah. And the reason why it was chosen for the uh, pace car duties is the fact that these big Chrysler V8s were extremely capable in racing. Yep. In NASCAR and uh, also they found their way into a number of European luxury marks like the Fossil Vega Oof. was powered by a big Chrysler V8 and it gave that quintessential post-war American effortless power. Yep. I mean, you know, you don't think about this much driving in a car which, which you perceive quite correctly mm. to be a very comfortable cruiser. But the fact that in 1956 this car went 0 to 60 in 11 seconds, yep. which may sound like a lot today, but 11 yep. seconds, let's be real, is a short period of time. Yeah. Well, yeah. especially in a car this big, but it's not just the, you know, the effortless power. It has driving dynamics. Yes, it's big. Yes, it's a, you know, bulbous body, but it handles very well for something, you know, 70 years old. And, you know, with this type of weight, I mean, 
it's it's pretty balanced. I mean, listen, you're not in you know Recaro, you know pole position seats uh, holding you in, but that's what the steering wheel is for, of course. But it, and, it's, uh, it it seems to handle itself very well on the road, right? And that's what that uh, wonderful grippy cloth upholstery is for as well. You're not sliding across a leather seat. Oh, that's what that's for. Okay, exactly. Right. You have the benefit of it. our uh, of our wonderful uh, wonderfully patterned. Uh, woven material here. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned when we first got in the car, you know, gosh, it's a lot of pink. And uh, pink was, of course, a very popular color in the 1950s. And interestingly enough, from a gender point of view, mm -hmm. men drove pink cars. It wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something that uh, today seems slightly odd in our world of gray, silver, gray, blue, silver, white, black cars. Mm -hmm. To have color at all, I think it's just such a delight as well when you're driving one of these cars yeah. because they feel alive. Yeah, it's it's very refreshing and you know, in the, in this period, you know, the you know, the Eisenhower interstate systems are getting all connected and you know, your car was really your uh, the how you portrayed yourself in society, you know, today it's the color of your iPhone and or the color <laughs> of your case or what what the knob looks like on the back of your iPhone 14 Pro Max Extendo, um, but this was how you showed the world who, what type of person and what type of family you were. I mean, how many color combinations were possible? I mean, there must have been hundreds of color combinations. There were indeed. Like I mean, uh, and in a time when um, people still took the time to order a car, yeah. you could sit down in the showroom and go through every one of the options with the uh, with the salesman mm -hmm. and, and really personalize the car to your specific tastes. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it must have been a very exciting thing and you know one of the other things that's just quite interesting about the cars of this period especially the Chryslers is the fact that there's a level of detail in them mm. that is unimaginable today yeah um, the way the dashboard is designed yeah with these great gauges and yep. and, and all of the, the detail in the, in the radio grill mm -hmm. uh, next to the uh, glove box yep. and all that is just fantastic of course the names are wonderful. Yeah. We were talking about, uh, <laughs> before we got into the car, you saying, why are all these cars named the Fire? <laughs> Fire's <And> cool. <laughs> <laughs> Fire is cool. And again, it was sort of just this reminder of the jet age. Yeah. You know, and uh, when you're in your Fire Dome, and the Firefly was the top of the Fire Dome line, mm -hmm. and uh, all the modern conveniences like the fi flight control, F-L-I-T-E control mm -hmm. shifter, which is uh, their brand name for the uh, wonderful uh, push-button shifter. Mm -hmm. um, another thing which is so funny about these cars, of course, is the fact that the shift control shows N, D, L, and R. Neutral, reverse, drive, and low. Mm -hmm. There's no park. Right. You park the car, you engage the parking brake, and that would become, in a few years, illegal. Mm. Because all cars sold in the U.S. had to have a parking gear, mm -hmm. so it's an automatic transmission. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, one of those things that sort of we take for granted today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not that not to have to worry about uh, getting out of the car and having it roll down right. the hill uh, right. when, you, when you finish. Well, you know, it's almost like the colors. Everything is so standardized today with, you know, the Prindle setup. And, you know, people just, you know, I feel like the vast majority of people at least get in their car, push the button, hit the D and they're off without thinking about it. But this was just a slightly, you know, futuristic and, you know, alternate way of thinking about how to propel yourself from point A to point B. And it's, even today, it's still fun to press the buttons and, and move the car around. It's, it's, it's so advanced for the time, it was really cool. It is, and it just feels futuristic. Yeah, it is, it really is. Yeah. And it works well, I mean, every, they, they do say push neutral, then push reverse or drive, and right. you know, make, as long as you make sure you do that, it's fine, but it, it's really a smooth way of, of shifting into drive. Yeah, if you, if you don't think of, of this as some sort of a 1956 dual clutch system where you just sort of punch right. the buttons at random right. and end up with a box full of neutrals, right. <laughs> uh, which is not sort of what you want to do. Right. But that, that shows where DeSoto's mind was at with this, and even for a mid, you know, a mid-grade car, as as they said, it was really advanced. You felt like you were getting something for your money with, you know, options like that, which is really neat. Chrysler's reputation in the 1950s and 60s was one of engineering. Yeah. Now, in the early 60s, they did fall into a bit of a spot with quality control, mm -hmm. um, and and that really did hurt them. But I think that that's also a 
part of their engineering and performance focus in the 1950s. Mm. They really did want to sort of push the envelope uh, when they could. Mm -hmm. uh, they had the torsion bar and front suspension and yep. lots of things that uh, were very advanced for the time. And let's get back to design, because as you know, design is a lot to me. Of course. And I love this forward look uh, design. I think it's one of the reasons why these cars are so interesting to so many people today. Yep. Um, well, you, they, look, you look at a 55, and it looks like a much older car. It looks like they advanced five or six years within one model year by just, you know, sloping the front a bit, changing the rear angle, adding a bit of, you know, fin action <clears throat> that everyone was doing. But it changed the entire, you know, outlook of the car. And uh, you mentioned a bit of fin action. I think that's an important thing to understand as well. Virgil Exner, who was the head of design for Chrysler, um, did incorporate fins, but because he had done so much work in Italy with people like Giovanni Savanuzzi, the great aerodynamicist, when fins came to Chrysler in the forward look, they looked more functional right. than the tacked-on fins that were going on at General Motors. Right. And uh, for me, that's also a great point of appeal for me in these cars. I just mm -hmm. love the way they look. Yeah, it's purposeful, and you know, it was their racing, you know, kind of background at the time, and they were they were absolutely serious about form following function as opposed to, you know, just absurdities form, everywhere. Form following chrome. Right, right. Uh, which seemed to be the case over at General Motors, but uh, yeah. enough criticism of, of, of good old Harley Earl. Mm -hmm. But it is also a thing that this car has so many of the wonderful dynamics that I love with the car period, and one of the things that, that makes it so satisfying to drive is the fact that people have an idea that cars in the 1950s sort of wallow on the road, mm. when in reality they sort of actually crush the road. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Uh, what we're, the roads we're driving on now are beautiful country roads, but they're not by any measure smooth. No. Um, but we're having a very comfortable ride in this car. It's very, it's very comfortable, but you understand what's going on below you. I mean, listen, we're not in the 2022 Rolls-Royce Cullinan, you know, <laughs> where you're, ba you, you're basically floating through life without understanding what the hell is going on. You have no idea there's a road underneath you. Yeah, I mean, you could be flying for, for you know, God's sake, but th you know, like, you know, we're in a nice turn right now. The car seems to load up pretty well. Um, and you're not just floating along. You you really know what's going on. And there's clearly some driving dynamics there. And we're going what, 45, 45 miles right now. And you know it could easily do this a bit faster, uh, confidently. The interesting thing is that the the road is also slightly moist, so I'm being as cautious as we possibly can. But it's also a matter of understanding the driving dynamics of the car and how to handle oh, of it. of course. We're gonna to come to a bit of road which I really love and is quite twisty, which yep. is great and, in sports and, cars. And then we'll show off our drifting dynamics right <laughs> <laughs> It's one of those things you should anticipate where the road is going, let the car go where yeah. it wants to go, and then slightly correct. Yeah, it's not a it's not a GT3. I mean, listen, you're not gonna make a last minute adjustment and the car's gonna say, yeah, brilliant, I'll, I'll do that, but you know. You can make a last minute adjustment, the results are going to be slightly it's, dire. It's almost like driving a boat, but a speed boat. It's, it, look you, ahead. It, yes, if you guide it and look ahead, it's gonna make that move. You know, you're not driving a Mack truck. It's far from that. And I think a lot of people, you know, are misconstrued about this era of, of American motoring in that, you know, oh, you know, there's a lot of play in the steering wheel and, you know, the brakes are kind of loose. It's like, yeah, but if you plan ahead as you're supposed to be driving, you know, with cars in this period, it drives very well. We, uh, we have forgotten an entire methodology of driving that used to be second nature. Yeah. You mentioned the brakes. Yeah. These are big drum brakes, mm -hmm. power brakes, and they're incredibly capable. Yeah. But you don't lean on them all the time because you do get brake fade. Yep. And um, it was a matter of understanding how a car behaves mm. and understanding what you need to do with a car mm. so that it wasn't just always sort of point squirt as fast as you can. Yeah. Modern cars, you, you mentioned before, the uh, smartphones, the iPhone, yep. and, and the incredible camera lens that an iPhone has. Yep. I, I always observe this, that you can take a spectacular picture yep. with an iPhone and not be a particularly good photographer. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna say, I still can't take good pictures <laughs> with my iPhone. But you know, you can drive some of the modern high performance cars yeah. and they flatter you yeah. to an amazing degree. Yeah. Well, and, and I think to me, it's, it's, this was an era of rear wheel driving. 
where everyone had a rear wheel drive car and there was a certain way you had to plant the front end and you know if you're just on the gas and turning the vehicle it's not going to turn and people you know with with front wheel drive cars today kind of taking over the landscape many of them are so advanced now you just turn it and it goes it's exactly. got plenty of grip and it'll do whatever it tells you uh, but th this was an era of you have to drive the car in a certain way or it will not respond and, and that's uh, point blank and uh, since I'm driving along with you mm -hmm. the B and ABS yep um, Anti-lock braking was something that was completely <laughs> unknown when no, this car was built. No, you can't just step on the damn brakes, then nothing happens. I remember uh, taking a uh, performance driving school, Yeah. and uh, one of the segments was, um, was focused on braking right. and on threshold braking. Yeah which is something that uh, a lot of people don't know a lot about. Yep. And the idea is that we're in the instructing cars and they turn the ABS off. Okay. And you have to come to a stop as quickly as possible without locking up the brakes. Yep. And the way you do that is you hold the brake pedal as hard as you can, you feel the brakes begin to lock and you slowly let up on them and then reapply. Yep. In effect, you're doing what ABS does, yep. but manually. Yep. And I did very well and the instructor said, wow, that was impressive. Yeah, you know, how'd you learn to do that? I said, hmm. I drive a lot of old cars. That's yeah. how you stop them. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's the only way to do it. And, you know, it's that it's that type of mentality with braking, turning, cornering properly. You know, there's a whole different way of, of behaving. And it's, you know, it's something that if you were to go to, you know, any autocross day as a rookie, you'd end up with an instructor with you. They basically teach you how to drive a car the right way. And then you leave and drive home and say, oh, yeah, this wow. makes sense. Wow, it seems much more efficient, you know? And so, uh, without being the, the grumpy old man, I think You're that, not the uh, grumpy old man. Okay, gotcha. You're just the grumpy man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, my age is nothing yeah. to do with it. Um, it is um, something that I wish more people would get the opportunity to experience. Yeah. Because the satisfaction of, of having a measure of car control with a car that doesn't do it all for you mm. is so incredibly satisfying. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, you've done a lot of high performance driving. Mm -hmm. You've got your really hot uh, BMW uh, 135. Yes, yep. And yep. Uh, you've got a Porsche 944. Mm -hmm. Cars with very different driving dynamics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that you enjoy experiencing different things. Uh, recently, you drove my Fiat Panda, yep. and and found that a revelation. That was for, a hot rod for for, for what it does. Yeah, it's it's again, it's not necessarily about the speed. No, it's not about the speed. It's it's about how it carries the speed and what you feel like when when you're driving. And to, to me, it's all about cars that have, you know, some sort of, you know, everybody says, oh, well, it's got great feel nowadays, but it's like, it's <laughs> how the car behaves and how you're able to kind of manipulate the driving experience. And you know, my two cars are both, you know rear-wheel drive uh, German coupes with turbochargers on them, but the way they deliver power is so different. And, you know, the the, the, uh, the 951, for example, with a, with a transmission in the back, it feels like a much more substantial car, and it's not a car you can just, like this, just turn in and go. It's, you know, there has to be some sort of plan to get through the corner, and with, you know, if you execute the plan correctly, it nails it every time. But, and that's the key thing executing the plan. In order to do that, you have to understand what the car does and, and how it does it. Yep. I remember doing an Audrain Motorsport uh, after Cars and Coffee lunch tour mm -hmm. with a bunch of folks, and most of them were in modern high-performance cars. I yeah. was driving the 1957 Lincoln Premier Coupe. Oh, yeah. This vast 1950s uh, concoction, also in coral. Yep. Um, and um, I remember hustling along and, and, and some of the folks on the tour being really impressed yeah. with how I was able to keep up. And I said, well, thank you very much for the compliment, yeah. but it's all about understanding the car. The car is a fast car. Yeah. And you have to understand how to use it. Yeah. As you said, anticipating the turns, yep. uh, not leaning too much on the brakes, mm -hmm. and then the car goes along and flows. Yeah. So yeah. it's, yeah. Uh, you know, there's a reason for the fire there's a reason there's a reason for the fire and there's a reason why people today still have an obsession with rear wheel drive cars it's you know there's a there's there's something about it that you know is actually well, I don't know you're driving the car and you actually have to you know think about what you're doing as opposed to just yanking the wheel and the car is not driving set. you no exactly.
vehicle. That's why these cars were so great is that it was a sense of drivability, but also a good sense of comfort for what, eight people in here? <laughs> you know, count the truck. We got the truck, yeah, that's double digits. Um, but it's just a great way to spend some time. And you know, right now you're hustling along pretty well on a, you know, on a crown wet road. And it's just, we could go maybe twice as fast. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I am so incredibly gratified to have brought along another acolyte to the 1950s glories of the forward look. Right. Thanks, man. It's been yeah. a great drive. No, this is great.